Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the uh, Wednesday meeting of the Kansas State Wednesday meeting of the Kansas State Board of Education. I notice that all members are present. A uh, motion would be in order to approve today's agenda, which looks like an exciting opportunity to hear about neat things that are happening in school. Kathy Bush makes that motion. Steve Roberts seconds that motion. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. And all opposed? Motion carries unanimously. So who do I call on? Okay, Jay, welcome. We're Tay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Chairman and, and State Board members. We are so excited about today and pleased to be able to present to you more Kansas school districts who have the right stuff. Uh, these districts are ready to launch and are eager to share their redesign plans with you all today. These Gemini One districts have worked diligently during the last year to plan and now execute a redesign in their schools. Last month, you may remember, seven Mercury districts came before the board and today we're pleased to have three Gemini One districts presenting their respective redesign plans to you. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen and engage uh, with our courageous redesign schools and for your continued support of the Kansans Can Redesign Initiative. So when we collected applications for the Mercury 7, um, it was clear that we had a lot of districts that not only had the passion, but they also had the building culture and the community support to continue with the redesign. So the Gemini 1 uh, districts, like the Mercury's, had to have a better than 80% vote of their staff. They had to have uh, the approval of their local board, and then they also um, had to have the approval of their local um, NEA or uh, negotiating um, organization. So um, this, this month you'll hear from three Gemini One schools. Next month you'll hear from um, three more. Um, what, is, what is amazing and what I'm so proud to say for these, these um, districts is that they kept the same pace as the Mercury's, um, but they did not have the same support. We, um, we did uh, Zoom meetings with them every other week to try to share with them what the Mercury schools were learning and what they were experiencing, um, and they just took off. And so without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Beloit and um, their small team here, and then they're going to have their teachers Zoom in um, as they are getting ready to uh, receive students later this week. Welcome. Thank you. I'm not for sure where the team's going to appear here, so I'm Jeff Travis, superintendent at Beloit, and I would like to introduce Karen Nemechek. She's our special ed director for the Beloit Cooperative. Nice to meet you. Thank you for this opportunity for us to share in our journey of redesign. Hold up. I just need access to the computer for a moment. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> oh, there we go. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. They're going to lead through it. So okay. Teachers and admin team there are going to lead through it. So I believe they're going to start with elementary, and then you guys probably ask some questions. All of my high school ask some questions. Okay, great. Thank you for letting us uh, do this on a distance platform so we can continue our, our staff development today. I'm Brady Dean, principal of uh, Boyd Elementary School, and I'm going to introduce my redesign team here. I have uh, Brad Treister, who's our special education teacher, Ann Pollins, Title I teacher. We have Jennifer Eilert, who's our social worker, and Tara Pruitt, who's our fourth grade teacher, Kayla Bonebreak, fifth grade teacher, and Janet Porter, who's assistant principal. And these guys are gonna do most of the talking because um, they're the ones that have really led this redesign effort. And, um, but we're gonna present to you two main initiatives that we're uh, implementing this year as part of our school redesign. 
Uh, one's project-based learning and the other is our social emotional learning. And I'm gonna turn it over to the teachers here so they can talk to you. All right, so I get to talk about project-based learning. So the first thing is why do we choose project-based learning? Um, it's a great way to teach students the content that they need in a meaningful and engaging way. Um, they're investigating, researching, brainstorming, um, using technology, creating material on real world um, topics. Um, as they do this, they're using those essential skills that we've decided um, our students need before they graduate, um, like working in a team, um, uh, flexibility, organization, um, cooperation and leadership as they work on these different projects. And it's a fun way for kids to learn the important information they need and develop skills. Um, and they retain all the information that they are learning. Okay. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Link does that too. So. A project to implement. Uh, one of the projects. Our school did is third grade always studies communities. And so they decided to use that as their project-based learning and students were put into partnerships and groups given a topic or a business in our community like the hospital, police station, grocery store. And then they researched that, sent letters to businesses in Boy, um, put speeches together that were videotaped and shared with the parents and then they made a model of their building out of boxes. Um, and then as these models were made, all three third grade classes got together and they built a city called Tridelphia, which is, there's that picture of it in your handout um, in the middle. Uh, then um, our city ad administrator actually came and talked with them. They received letters back from businesses. so. This was a great way for students to learn about the important skill of um, communities in a fun way that they'll remember for a long time. All right, another example of project-based learning that we did last year was our first grade recycling versus trash. First graders read books and traveled to the landfill and recycling center. See how these operations are actually ran. And at school, students collected a day's worth of trash and then sorted it out into what is recycling and what is trash. And it was an eye-opening experience to the kids to see how much of our trash is actually recyclable, um, which is real-world learning. And these students, most of them, actually had fun with the grossness of this project. So then one teacher took it even further and did a donor's choose page to be able to get recycling bins to put in our classrooms for paper and plastic. And then once a week, her class would come around and pick these up and then they would take the stuff to our re big recycling bin. <clears throat> and then another one <clears throat> is our sixth grade did a change the world project-based learning where they chose a topic that was important to them. Important to us. So and <laughs> <laughs> $650 for our autism classroom. And this is just a great, meaningful, real world learning for our students that they will never forget. And we would say that as a school, we are just in the beginning stages of implementing. And that this year, we're going to continue with our book study and our PLCs. We plan on visiting other classrooms that have already implemented project based learning. And we want to continue doing some professional development. Um, each grade will choose another project or projects that they feel comfortable to use in their classrooms this year. And we think project-based learning is an opportunity to change our school for the better. And I'm gonna turn it into, over to Ann and Jennifer to talk about social emotional. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna talk about our Boys Town well-managed schools. Um, we started this four years ago because we saw a need for a more consistent behavioral model throughout our school. The model has helped us reduce overall behavior concerns as well as reinforce positive behaviors in our students. And Boys Town gives teachers and administrators tools to help de-escalate situations. And um, our school has implemented many positive classroom 
um, and individual incentives through this Boys Town um, model, such as um, class compliments when the class is seen doing um, what they're supposed to be doing in out, outside of the classroom, the class can earn a, a, a class compliment and then they get um, free recess or an extra recess or maybe even an, an ice cream party. Um, the individual students can also earn Trojan bucks where they can spend that money at our Trojan store and just buy little um, items that they would like to have. Uh, then this year, we're starting um, a BES skills time, and it's going to be at the beginning of each day for 10 minutes throughout the building. And the teachers are going to be, we'll have a skill of the week, and then the teachers will be given different topics to discuss regarding that skill, um, such as where can you use the skill that we're talking about in the school, where can you use this skill in the community, and so forth. And then the end, we're going to end the week by discussing how they use the skill during the week, how the students use that skill during the week. We're also going to share this with parents um, via social media so they will see what the students are learning and maybe they can reinforce that at home. We also have um, a well, uh, wonderful counseling center our school has a general education and a special education social worker that um, share the counseling center. It's a very warm and inviting space that students are allowed to ask their teacher to come to if they feel they need a calming down period um, or just someone to talk to. Teachers are also allowed to send students that they see a need for that might need a break. They see that they're starting to get a little agitated. And so they can send the students down to the counseling center to, to kind of just calm down a little bit. Within the counseling center, there's a safe calming corner um, with tools that help the students self-regulate themselves. Um, and then the social workers, of course, also have caseloads of students that they see weekly, as well as group, small groups in the counseling center. I'm gonna let Jennifer. Finish up. Okay. A couple new things that we're going to implement um, this coming school year at, our, at Boyd Elementary School. Um, the first one is called Keys to Success. Um, we're going to have each classroom teacher every month nominate a student that they see has been demonstrating the character trait for that month. Um, and then we're going to hold a character assembly each month um, where those students will receive recognition. We're going to take a picture of them and display the picture in our display case in the lobby of our elementary school. And we're going to share that picture then on our school TV as well as um, our Facebook and Twitter pages. The students also will get to have a pizza party with the principal um, when they earn that um, privilege. And they will, they'll, they will wear a special lanyard. Um, that's going to help identify them throughout the school. That way other teachers and students know that they've earned that privilege for the month. And then their classroom teachers can also um, give them extra privileges that month, such as maybe sitting where they want at lunch or being first to line up in class and things like that. We're also um, going to implement the Oveus Bullying Prevention Program this school year. Um, over the last couple of years, we've seen a need um, for some form of bullying prevention in our school. And so after a lot of research, um, we decided that this evidence-based program is the best program for our school to implement. We're gonna implement it for kindergarten through sixth grade. Um, the goals for this program include redu reducing existing bullying problems in our school, helping us prevent the development of future bullying programs or bullying problems and achieve better peer relations at school. Um, the school social worker, which is me, I'm going to get go into each classroom twice a month and lead class meetings. Um, each meeting will have a different topic and um, through that topic, we're going to help the students learn more about bullying, um, help them empower themselves to try to prevent bullying problems um, and just learn more about themselves. 
the meetings are different than like a typical curriculum in which we don't, I'm not just going to stand up and teach to them. It's going to be more of a general discussion um, and conversation that I will help guide. Along with this program, there is a bullying questionnaire that we will administer twice a year um, for grades third through sixth grade. And this questionnaire will be able to give us feedback um, in regards to what type of bullying program the students feel are in our school. Then we can use that questionnaire to help guide those class meetings. So, I think that's cool. that's it from the elementary school. Do you guys have any questions on the elementary school aspects? Yeah, if we do, we'll hold all of our questions to the end of the entire presentation. And, and, and all right, perfect. That's perfect. I'm Casey Seifer. I'm the principal at Boyd High School, and we're kind of up in the, the middle row here. Tammy Channel is our school librarian. Eric Lampert is a math teacher, and then Kyle Eisner, our assistant principal, and we're going to talk about um, our advisory period pride time and then uh, some, some flexible scheduling and uh, seating that we're looking at. One of the things that I we do it kind of encompasses a lot of our goals is our pride time. It used to be just homeroom where kids would come in and it's a study hall. We've moved that to where it's more of an advisory period. Um, so it gives us, we keep the kids for four years now rather than having a new set of kids each year. It gives us a little bit of an opportunity uh, to develop deeper relationships with those kids. Uh, and then we do a number of things with those kids uh, through that time. Uh, one of them we do is grade checks uh, where uh, weekly we will have them check or show us their grades and discuss their grades with them and, uh, and see where they're at and any kids that are struggling uh, we're going to have a discussion with them and send them and talk to the, the teacher that they need to work with on those kind of things. Uh, so we try to stay, you know, kind of hold them accountable uh, through that kind of a deal. Um, we also um, spend a lot of time in pride time with character ed lessons. Uh, so, I mean, we've done a variety of things with those. I think Kyle is going to talk about uh, specifics on what we've done with character ed, but we spend pride time using uh, that for character ed lessons. Uh, we also um, work with things like individual plans of study, our, our career cruising, our Zello, those kind of things in pride time. Um, the other thing that I would add that we've done in pride time is our pride time has been asked to, uh, to do, we've asked the kids to do one small thing, we call it, uh, where they decided one thing that they could do to make the school a better place, and uh, and then they are kind of held accountable as far as implementing that, and there we have a variety of things that they do with us. Well, like Eric said, I'm going to touch on Character Ed, which has been a very strong push in our high school and junior high the last four years. Um, Beloit, for the 17 years, has been a serving service learning school. Uh, it, it's, it's something that we take pride in, giving back to a community that gives so much to us. Um, Red is every Friday in our pride time and, and kind of like Eric mentioned it's very advisory led our, our advisors that have the same kids for four years in high school and our junior high kids have the same advice for two years um, receive these lessons last year uh, we began using the Medal of Honor program we were fortunate enough to have uh, a Medal of Honor winner here uh, for an in-service last year for our teachers which was, was outstanding uh, before that we used Justin's Renaissance program um, it, we don't necessarily have any physical numbers, but office referrals and discipline issues have decreased dramatically, and we think it has a lot to do with the character ed. Um, Beloit is uh, very proud to say that we are a state and national school of character. I received some awards last spring. Um, it, it doesn't mean that everything's perfect, but it sure means that we work uh, and, and are as Ann mentioned, we as well implement the Boys Town um, well-managed classrooms, um, really hitting on the soft skills with our students. Um, we learn those uh, through the character ed as well. So it's something we've hit on and something we see uh, paying off right now in Beloit. Um, Pride time, one of the biggest things I think that uh, Casey and I would agree just come out of Pride time was our student-led conferences last spring. It is it's probably the most measurable thing that we've done in the last couple of years. Um, the spring conferences were, were kind of floating around in the mid-40s with attendance. 
Um, unfortunately, we had a lot of people feel they held little value um, holding them in the spring. Um, we, we kind of flipped that. We put it on the students and the advisors. It, it, the the student-led conference is with their Pride Time advisor. Uh, the students set it up with their parents. They made the phone call. Um, last year, in the first year of implementation, we had 97% attendance. Uh, we heard some amazing things from parents, things like, we had no idea this was going on. We didn't know our student was interested in it, or our son or daughter was interested in this type of field of study outside of high school. Um, just an amazing amount of compliments. Obviously, the high attendance was something we were really excited about. Our counselors and Mr. Seifert and myself, there was a lot of hard work that went into it, a lot of unknown going into the student-led conferences, and, and they couldn't have went any better in the of implementation. Um, and kind of lead more into kind of the student-led conferences, the individual plans of study, and let Casey kind of talk about those with you. When we talk about pride time, uh, we, we try to utilize that time as, as efficiently and effectively as possible. And it's one thing that's it's much more difficult because it's at the end of the day, you don't have a, a ton of uh, just relax downtime. And so we looked at career cruising. How can we utilize that? So on Mondays, not only grade checks, but we also give tasks for the week in career cruising for career exploration. And when and Kyle just talked about student-led conferences, that's what parents didn't know about. Like, my kid's interested in these things. How, how why don't I know that before? And it's because they've never had that conversation. So student-led conferences led to uh, the, the communication about career cruising. What do you want to do when you're an adult? What are your likes and what are you good at? Um, just because you like something doesn't mean you're good at it. And so we looked at those skills and we try to match them up uh, by looking at their uh, inventories. And then they go and they find internships, externships, classes that they might want to take. And we try to individualize each kid's schedule to that. We create classes for students that are interested in those classes and, and who might say, hey, I really want to go to the vet. So we'll create an independent study class where they go to the vet, work there, but also learn the science behind a certain aspect. And that's what they really focus in on. When we look at their goals, we set long-term goals and short-term goals, especially, you know, a seventh grader's goals are going to change multiple times in their likes and dislikes. And I know you guys use the example a lot where seventh graders are going to say they want to be a vet because they like animals. And we realize big picture, you better like science. So that, that's the common standard. But that's what we want to see is what do you like and what are you good at? And then you guys formulate the path. So we put a lot of onus on our kids to come up with your direction. We will provide the uh, stairs and we will provide the guidance to get you there, but it's, it's your future so that when you go to post-secondary and you go to a tech college or you go to uh, a four-year, you're not bouncing around and flipping majors four times. You already have an idea, like, I already know I like this because I explored that career at, uh, interest. We're going to move on to, in terms of creating class for yourself, where we continue to try to give our students more opportunities in marketing in real life by how we're redesigning our library and our, our class schedule around that. And I'll let Tammy talk about that. Okay, well, we began the redesign of our library into more of a learning commons um, starting last spring, and that process has continued. We had two main goals in mind with doing this. Um, the first one is what Casey talked about and giving our students a more flexible area um, anything from what they want to do individually all the way up to the larger class. So we still have enough tables and things like that provided there um, for classes to come in as a large group. Um, we also have media areas that we're setting up um, that have um, whiteboard writable surfaces so that kids can come in in small group groups and collaborate. Um, they can plug in via USB on any device and work together on um, something that they're doing for class or something they're doing for an independent study. It also gives us an area where we can offer some of those um, elective partnerships with our technical college or community colleges, such as CNA classes, CMA classes. Uh, we're looking at doing a HoloLens offering um, for our students. So that, that um, smaller group area gives us that. Uh, we're designing it with the, the concept of having it be open so that um, as we progress down the road, um, our students can have more of a flexible schedule and a space that actually provides for that. Had we not done the redesign, um, the flexible schedule would be very difficult because there would be no place for students to get to that. 
The second goal for the library redesign was creating a coffee shop that will be a student-led business. And while a coffee shop is no um, unique concept, um, I think we have a somewhat unique concept because we have a community partnership that we're going to form for this um, coffee shop. We have an existing business in town that's agreed to mentor um, our students all the way from business plan to execution, um, expenditures, all of those little things that small business owners go through that maybe classroom teachers wouldn't be able to hit on. Um, the community partnership part of this is, is vital to our success, and we're excited about that. Some of the things that we think will come from this um, for our students that we can already see, um, our marketing students will be the ones who will work with the owners of the coffee shop in town, uh, the business plan, and go through that whole process. Um, right now we have the flooring in and the rest of it is up for student creation and student design because we want this to be theirs. Our graphic design students will come up with uh, the menu looks like, all of the signage um, that they will create. We want our special education students to be involved um, during, er during times that are not regular hours. Uh, with existing pair of support, we would like our special education students to be able to learn how to read an order, take an order, verify that that order is correct, deliver it appropriately, so that they get some of those real world skills that they can use. Um, one other option would be um, our students being able to somehow order online um, during times where the coffee shop is closed. STEM might go ahead and create the app for that or find one that already exists. And lastly, um, we're looking into the possibility of some independent studies that students can take through the school. We have students who are already very interested in um, baking and you know, might possibly be looking at some type of a culinary degree after school, um, after they get out of high school. So this would give them an opportunity to take an independent study, learn some of the science and skills behind what they're looking at for their future, and still be a part of that program right here while getting credit while in high school. Um, so where we are right now, um, our flooring was literally finished yesterday. <laughs> um, our um, furniture for the Learning Commons should be delivered. Um, it's been postponed a couple of different times, but should be delivered any day. And then um, that coffee shop partnership with the existing community business um, will begin when school starts. So we're very excited to see what the students are going to create and allow them to have a business while still in school. Hey, Mr. Travis, are you going to talk about STEM, or do you want us to go to the ALC? Please move to the back. K through 12, we have a K through 6 STEM program, uh, 7 through 12. It is aligned, has been a lot. We've aligned it just a year ago so that it flows. Um, just some of the projects that the uh, K through six, uh, flying bricks. I don't know if you guys know what a flying brick is. It's a, a drone made of Legos. And when it explodes, they pick it back up, put it back together, and uh, make it work again. And they try to make it work more efficiently again. We have uh, elementary kids that are 3D printing, uh, programming, coding. Um, I went in and um, one day to, to see how STEM was going, and elementary kids were making video games through coding. Uh, pretty neat stuff. It goes clear up to the uh, junior senior high where they send me videos of homemade hoverboards going down the hallways with made out of a piece of plywood, shower curtain, and a leaf blower. Um, we had a young man make a CNC router that was probably a three thousand dollar machine that he made from scratch for about two hundred dollars in his STEM class. Uh, very impressive things, and I'm just barely touching on what they're doing. I, I do. I did one of the best moments is when we presented at the Kansas Can conference and the kids were showing HoloLens off. If you've not seen a HoloLens, phenomenal virtual reality beyond what you can believe that our kids are working with. We had some uh, students working with Microsoft to uh, help them with uh, their own product. In fact, we had a young lady that was pairing them and Microsoft said, you mean you could, how did you pair them? And uh, she had them paired. So neat stuff. I remember that the Kansas can was, I walked out and I have one of my elementary students and we're at the Hilton in Manhattan, uh, at the Hilton in Manhattan at the conference and I look out and Mr. 
or Commissioner Watson standing there beside one of my kids and they're running it clear to the top of the ceiling. It was, you know, that was one of those kids' favorite moments that he got to present that. He didn't know it was the Commissioner of Education he was presenting it to, but it was, we're doing good things like that and the kids are having fun and it's making learning just awesome for the kids. So, and I will let Amanda go on from there with uh, the ALC and Special Ed. Okay. Um, Aaron, are you wanting to start? Would you like me to? It's up to you. You can start and I'll finish it, okay? Okay. So, um, I'm Amanda Thiessen. I've been teaching at the Alternative Learning Center for, um, I think I'm going on eight years now. Um, when we started the Alternative Learning Center, we had nothing in place, I felt like. We had all online education. Um, I kind of needed a direction to go. So we got into the Boys Town educational model. Um, at the Alternative Learning Center, we do the specialized model, which is just a step more than the well-managed that we do in our uh, gen ed dis uh, buildings. Um, we have three, we're going on the seventh year of that, and we've seen tremendous growth from our students that have had to go through that program. We require most of our kids that go through there to um, complete the whole program before returning back to their home district. Um, at the Alternative Learning Center, we work on um, small group as well as individual counseling for all of our students. Um, small group to work on those social skills that they're going to need in real life, how to talk to other people, those type of things, as well as um, talking about their individual needs with a counselor whenever needed. We're excited this year. We, With the expansion of our Alternative Learning Center, we've been able to add a counseling center within our school um, for K-12 students. Um, it seems to be a more inviting um, environment this year, so I think our students are really going to like that when they come in and see it. Um, we'll offer group and individual counseling in that room, as well as some cool downtime if they just need to get away from the classroom. We've got some um, pretty neat things in there for them to do. Another thing we've added this year, we've always kind of done some life skills for for our students, but we were able to um, add even more this year. We're adding washer and dryers, we're adding a dishwasher, um, so we can help some of those students that need those real world um, skills to go out. Um, let's see. We work very closely with our home district staff. Um, our teachers help us with lesson plans. They help us with um, the materials that we need because our main goal is to transition kids back into their schools. Um, we don't want kids to stay with us all the time. We want them to be with their peers and where they're comfortable um, back in their actual, their towns that they are from. So that's our number one goal is that transition piece. Another piece that we do work on though is um, suspension and expulsion. When kids are not able to go back into their regular districts, we're gonna take them in and provide that education because we all know those kids need education. It's not okay for them to sit at home after being expelled or suspended. Um, so we're gonna take that on and help them get through that. We also, are there for kids who are, are um, at high risk for dropout. Um, I think we've got a pretty good rate when we talk about um, our alternative learning center. Um, currently, currently we're at a 90% transition rate back into home districts. We have had one student out of the the seven or eight years I've been here that has come back to me um, or come back to our district after we've transitioned them. So I feel pretty confident with that. As well as we've got a 90% graduation rate um, for students that have to graduate out of our, out of our building. Um, 
the relationship part of ALC, I think, is a huge aspect. Um, the relationships with those home districts to figure out what's the best for this student, because maybe that that traditional setting is not what they need. And I'm going to let Karen go a little bit more off of that. Thank you, Amanda. And um, some of you may be wondering, because she, she several times talked about other districts, uh, we are cooperative. And so this program serves our cooperative. So we have five districts in that cooperative, and all are a, a, they can all use that alternative learning center for services for their students. This year, we did go to the legislature and ask if we could expand that, because every day I was receiving phone calls literally pretty much every day, either from parents saying, can we enroll our student in your program, or judges trying to court order kids into our program, or just from outlying districts saying, hey, can we place our kid into your program? And so, of course, those answers had to be no at that time because we didn't have room. And um, so really, when we look at the Alternative Learning Center, that's what it is. We do several things in one. It started as being a center for kids that the behavior was so extreme that they just could not be in the regular classroom. And as we started that, we have evolved, we have grown, and we started with the specialized classroom model, realizing that's not enough. We have now incorporated that with trauma-informed care and trauma-sensitive schools, and that marries very, very well together because um, when you talk about trauma-informed care, you're talking about other parts of the brain when you're talking about Boys Town Specialized Model, you're talking about being able to really work with your cognitive part of your brain. So marrying those two pieces together, I think will make this program extremely successful. And we do, as Amanda alluded to, kids that come into the program, we have three tracks, if you caught that. Our one and main goal is to get kids back into their home districts. And, and to do that, it's very, very important that we don't do just put them online on a computer and say, here it is. So the, the home districts are very much involved. They have to send their daily and weekly lesson plans so that that can be done and tailored in our facility so that kids are kept up. And, and we also have quarterly meetings so that the home districts come in and meet and they can see the progress of the student. And then so when we have our transition back, one of our staff goes out, we model the what's going on, so it's not just like all too often we see that where kids come back from a residential treatment facility and here they are. And it's just back to what it was and nothing has changed. And our idea is, you know, we're gonna have you go back, but we're gonna go back with you. And you'll have gone through this program and been to the merit level where you have the skills you need and we will mimic the skills that you're seeing in the classroom before we transition back. And then not only that, but we'll go back with you. So a staff member will go back and model those skills to the teacher in the home school, making sure that we have successful transition. And that has been successful because our reintegration rate is at 90%. Our graduation rate for students that are at high risk of dropout that come into our program, which is a, it's a scheduled program that's entirely based on their needs, and it can be a child that is a student with a disability or without. And so when they come in, we look specifically at what their needs are. And it may not be that traditional program of coming in at 8.30 and leaving at 3.30. It may be that if this is a student who really doesn't, doesn't come to school until 10 o'clock every day, we may say, okay, you come in at 10. You come in at 10 and we'll get you out here by 3.30, but in between that time, we'll make sure that we get what you need. So it's working with kids based on what they can do, working on, again, some of those we might do some computerized instruction to do credit recovery. However, it's never all computerized because that relationship building is absolutely critical to what we do. So those kids, when they leave, we get those life skills embedded into that curriculum and we also try to work very, uh, in depth with our local technical college to have them uh, either go on to some kind of a career or have them in hand being able to walk out with some kind of a job that they can go to. So that would be the other track. And again, the next one is the suspension and expulsion. I'll touch on that one again. None of us believe that just suspending a child or expelling a child works. 
And, you know, when I talk about that to people, I say, what skill did you give that child to come back with that's going to make them do better with that behavior? Did you give them a skill to replace what happened? Suspension and expulsion does not do that. And while it has its place, and we have to sometimes do that because they can't be around all kids, we have to have an answer. And that's why I asked the state to give us a pilot program that other districts could look at doing something like this because it is that important that we don't just suspend and expel kids to go home, that we let them come into a program like this that, A, when they come in, they have to bring their work with them so they're not going to get behind on work, and they have to, we have to know what happened because what happened is some kind of a social skill deficit. What happened is something that we can work on. And when they go back to the districts then that they came from, then we can go back with what do you do to make it right? So they have to go make it right. And then they also have to go back and be able to just move forward. So we're very, very excited about that program. And again, I'm anxious to start keeping data on that and do some follow-up with that and see where that's going to go. But we've had, we have done that within our own district and our own cooperative, and it has been very well received, and parents are really liking that as an alternative to just having kids stay at home. So I could go on and on, but I won't do that. So you can't get me talking up here about our program because I get too excited about it. So. I'll stop with that and say if you have any questions. Okay, are there questions? And, and let me explain to the board. We absolutely have to stay on schedule today, so if we start having questions, I'll cut you off at some point. But, uh, <laughs> Sally? Uh, I have one question. Through uh, your rede redesign, f for one thing, it's awesome to hear from all of you, and um, I appreciate the hard work that you've all done. Um, through this work, I'd like to know what barriers or regulations that have kept you from doing what you really want to do or that we need to change to help you. So uh, that's a fantastic question because uh, uh, our board's been pretty supportive in, in terms of when we have some ideas out there and, and if we want to go a specific direction, um, specific barriers. Obviously, if you're going to make wholesale changes, we have costs and, and things associated with that, but our board's been, been overly willing to, to say, if we're going to redesign and we're going to put kids first, we will figure out a way to pay for it. Uh, that's always going to be a barrier. Um, just making sure that we hit the standards that are that are required. I think in the last few years, the, the state uh, and KSDE has been really uh, supportive in not focusing so much on test scores and that. So that's always just the added um, relaxation point. Like we don't have to freak out about those quite as much as we were five years ago. I would say echo that when at the elementary school when we're looking at project-based learning. These projects um, sometimes can take several weeks to complete, and I know that gave a lot of anxiety to some of the teachers that, you know, we have to be on this certain lesson at this certain time because in March or April, we're going to be taking a, a state assessment. They're going to grade me on this, and I think that the message has been, you know, if we do what's right for kids, the state assessments will take care of themselves and relaxing on that and not focus on the test score, but focus on what's right for kids. It's been a, a shift in thinking that will continually need to be and so that uh, we're not feeling the need to drill and kill these kids in preparation for a, a, a test at the end of the year, but we're giving them rich in-depth learning experiences that are still tied to the state standards and we're still they're still learning those standards but uh, relinquishing that control uh, back to the teachers um, that that's been a, a help time and finance are always barriers um, but it's getting better you know and we're working through that we're finding resources you guys have helped get us resources that has helped a ton um, you, know, you always have barriers with the with the expansion of the ALC. The fire marshal and I and Karen and our architect have 
become very, uh, I don't know that good friends are, are the way to describe <laughs> that, but we, we're on first name basis um, because he has other ideas sometimes to, that we need to do because it's a lockdown facility, you know, and, and to keep those kids first and secure, you have to be a lockdown facility. Um, it's just how it is. Those are barriers that we have, but, but my team has stated it right. Our board says if it's right for kids, let's find the resources and let's get it done. So it's, it's been great, and that's what I feel like the state board has been too. So thank you for that. Kathy, and this will be the last question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you for the Beloit team for presenting. You sounds like you guys have done a lot of hard work, and uh, it's fun to hear what you've been doing. I think maybe the, uh, the principal kind of answered my question, but I was going to ask in your project-based learning, when you're designing that, you know, how you go about designing that and then incorporating, because I assume you're bringing in a lot of different content areas into that project-based learning when you design that. So if you could talk just a little bit about that, that would be great. Yeah, we, we use the uh, Buck Institute planning guide, and it's a lot of upfront planning, but there is still student choice. Um, we are in our uh, infancy of implementation, and so this past year, we did the book study with the Buck materials and planned a single project within, uh, we, we kept it within one uh, subject and unit for now. Um, but our plans are to expand and incorporate specials through our art, our library media, our technology feature, and bring them in and incorporate multiple learning standards within a single project unit. Um, to, some, some of them incorporated some of the art last year uh, and used our, our, our specials teachers, but that's that, that'll be a continued focus to where we can uh, get multiple learning standards. And then it's a struggle too. We're still trying to figure out how to ensure that students have learned those standards within that project and how to, ma how to measure that. And we're looking at alternative ways that we can um, say with confidence that this student learned these learning standards through participating in this project. And so. Um, those are things that as we continue our journey through project-based learning, we think in three years from now we're going to look a lot different than we are going to this year um, as we continue that continuous improvement um, through the next couple years with this. Well, it sounds like a pretty, pretty thoughtful way to, to implement project-based starting in one content area and then expanding it. So, yeah, I appreciate the, the feedback on that. Thank you very much. And whose district is Beloit in? Do you have a motion to make, Nina? I do, but I'd like to first say that it's with great pride that I will make this motion. And I hope that any time you have a problem with something we've got set a roadblock in front of you, you will not hesitate to immediately let us know that so we can not be the roadblock, but we can be the to help facilitate. So with that, I move to accept the redesign plans of Beloit USD 273 for Beloit Elementary and boy, junior, senior high to be implemented during the 2018 to 19 school year as a participant in the Gemini One project. Is there a second? Steve seconds that motion. Uh, Any further discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, unanimous support. Thank you very much. We have certificates and uh, and uh, banner to present to those of you that are here. Sorry we can't be there with you uh, to do that. We really appreciate that. And uh, the board will reconvene at 9.55. Thank you very much.
Very exactly right. All right, super. So we'll... One minute. And one minute is 9.55. It's over schedule. I wanted to make sure we, if we needed to adapt, we would. So. No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> whose district is whose district is this? I do too. This is Scott. Yeah, you have that. Okay. Okay, Jamie. Next up, we would like to invite Crap Skyline USD 438. All right. Okay. Um, I'm Becca Flowers, and I'm the superintendent at Skyline. And I just want to start by saying, gosh, thanks for having us here today. This is exciting to be able to, to share this plan with all of you. Um, you may know that Skyline's a rather unique district in that our entire district is located under one roof. So we, uh, gosh, we share a facility, but we wind up sharing families and activities, uh, meals, all sorts of things, but most importantly, we really share a philosophy of education across that PK through 12th grade. And it's, it's neat because we get to watch kids come to our district as early as four years old, and then we get to be involved in that education. Everybody's involved in that educational journey all the way through their high school graduation. But as a result of that, one of the things um, that may be a little bit different today with our plan is you're not going to see an elementary redesign plan and a high school redesign plan. We've combined ours into uh, one district-wide redesign plan. So with that, to tell you just a little bit about our, our journey on this redesign, we've been talking about school reform and redesign, innovation, things like that for a good decade. And the world is flat came out like, 2006 something like that and that was if you remember that was pretty disruptive it caused a lot of controversy but gosh you couldn't put that book down without realizing that we were going to have to make some pretty major changes in education and so we shared that information with our staff and then over the last 10 years or so we we continued to gosh we we read blog posts we read books we we read posts we went to uh, conferences and had a lot of great discussions about what we could do and we'd get really excited about it but inevitably we felt like we were kind of stopped in our tracks because the current or the well the old system just didn't allow us to implement those innovative ways of going about school that we were reading about and learning about. We were, we were kind of in an assessment cage, and we were encouraging our teachers to break away from that, but gosh, they were in the same, same cage also, and they, they felt a lot of pressure to teach to the test because those were the metrics that were made public. And so it, it was just kind of a frustrating time, but then, as you know, uh, when Brad and Randy went across the state and they asked communities and lots and lots of people, what it was that Kansas wanted from their education system, uh, they, you know, they got some brand new results that we hadn't heard before from the State Department anyway. And when they came back through and told us what those results were, they shared KISA with us. And KISA in itself was exciting. It was so exciting to finally see an accreditation system that wasn't going to hinge on just test scores. So we were already excited with KISA coming out, and then let alone we, we saw that we had the opportunity to redesign. We got really excited. And the way we looked at that was, um, you know, we had KISA, and it was great, but then redesign was just ramping up and speeding up uh, that implementation of KISA. So we were, we were so excited to see that, and we applied to be a uh, to be a redesigned district last summer. And of course, we aren't one of the Mercury schools, but when Jay called, you know, he made it clear that we were going to get to move forward with redesign. We were excited and ready to roll. And so with all of that, we had the go button and we were, we were ready. So last summer, we started school. Things that we started doing was 
we went, the first thing was we formed a, what we called a Gemini Council, and it was just a group of, of our staff that were interested in being on the team that was going to come up with the redesign uh, plan. So from there, oh, wrong button. Um, we facilitated some conversations with our Board of Education. In fact, for quite a while, we, we visited with our board almost monthly and tried to get some feedback with them and tell them what we were looking at doing and why we were doing it, things like that. One of the really neat events that where we really learned a lot was we had a big community meeting in November. We Gosh, we brought in people that represented businesses, um, higher education, churches, law enforcement, any sector of the community we could think of. We brought them in and, and we asked them, what do you need to see in a Skyline graduate? And of course, it was no surprise. It was the, the same thing that, that people across the state had told Brad and Randy, but it was neat to hear it on a community level. And it got some great conversations going within our community. So anyway, we had that. We also, at the same time, last year was our, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of our district. And so that was a great opportunity for us to kind of let people know that we're still going to, we want to honor that legacy that's in our district. Our, our district has a, a really neat history. And we can still honor that even if we make some changes and move forward and provide a relevant education for today's kids, for today's world. So it, it was a good opportunity to be able to have some of those conversations. Uh, we formed research teams and we just continued to uh, pilot little steps throughout the year. And then at the end of the year, after doing all those things, we were able to come up with our vision statement. We firmed up our vision statement and our redesign plan. And the vision statement that we came up with is, uh, I'm going to read it to you real quickly. The vision of Skyline Schools is to provide a positive team culture, meaningful learning, and real world experience that empowers students to thrive through their PK through 12 experience in preparation to pursue their passions beyond graduation. Now, we've had vision statements before, and they look really pretty hanging on the wall, and, and they're kind of impressive, but we want far more than just something some pretty statement that's going to hang on the wall. What we have embedded in that vision statement is three promises that we, we are just serious about that we want to provide for every single child in our district. So from that vision statement comes these three promises, which I just mentioned a little while ago, that every student in our district will go through from the time they're four till the time they graduate as a 17 through 18 year old. They, they will experience a positive teen culture, meaningful learning, and real world experience. And that's the three promises that we are making to the students and the families of our district. And our entire redesign plan is, is wrapped around those three promises. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and have the, the principals and the teachers tell you about the redesign plan. Um, I'll start out by introducing our principals and then they'll introduce the, the teachers to you. But our high school and middle school principal is Herb McPherson and Diane House is our elementary principal and she also does some work as an assistant principal with the middle school and high school. So from there, I'm gonna turn it over to them. So we'll start with promise number one, surrounding our students and families and community with a positive team culture. We had three research and action teams within that. Uh, two of those are here today and I'll represent uh, the one that couldn't, but I, I can't think of any two better guys to introduce you to what we hope to achieve through a positive team culture in our district. We have Kenny Eddy who's our high school social studies teacher, head boys basketball coach, assistant football coach, conditioning coach. He's a coach. <laughs> He's beloved by our students and their families and the staff too, and he represents a, a passionate and committed educator and coach. We also have Stephen Novotny, who's our K-8 music teacher. He's also husband to Brittany and dad to Mathis. We really value his unique perspective. He's a Skyline graduate, and so he went on to further his education and came back home does really awesome things in our building, like creating fifth and sixth grade rock bands that play during middle school, high school lunch. So these are guys that can tell you a lot about this. I hand it over to you, Kenny. 
I'm the coach, apparently. <laughs> and to start out with our culture as a whole, we identified three pillars that we needed to fix or begin to take steps forward within. And that was staff-to-staff -staff culture, staff-to-student culture, and then student-to-student -student culture. And then here on the screen, you'll see three ways that we are taking those steps forward. To start off, staff-to-staff, we believed that we needed to be completely transparent with each, with each other, with our students, with our administration, with uh, our community. There shouldn't be, everything should be, should be seen clearly, what we're doing, what we're trying to do, and what we're gonna be doing going forward. Now, staff to student was where we needed to make our biggest leap. We had to, if we're talking about redesign, we're talking about teaching a little differently. We got to stop teaching or trying to reach kids like they're our subordinates and start treating them like they're human beings. Um, we got to move away from these Machiavellian principles where we need to rule out of fear and instead of love. Uh, you know, I think history has proven that when we, when we teach and we lead from love, those get the results that we want. And then we're teaching them to do that when they grow. So uh, move less Bobby Knight, and uh, <laughs> that's probably a, an easier correlation for everyone. And then another one was that we're constantly, and this is easy to talk about as a coach, we're constantly asking kids to get better, uh, to improve, to work hard. And we have to look ourselves in the eyes as a staff and say, are we doing the same thing? Are we improving every day? Um, are, are we trying to improve as educators? Are we learning our content more? Are we finding ways to develop their brains? Um, and I think that's a hard reality for a lot of teachers to swallow because we get so set in our ways and it's easier for us to uh, just continue down the same path. But if we're going to be asking them to, we have to be willing to do that with them on an everyday basis. And the most important one probably that we're trying to build towards is relationship based and we got to take time to laugh in class every day. Uh, they cannot dread coming into your classroom because they think that there can't be any fun and I've seen a lot of coaches online this summer talking about kids playing Fortnite instead of being in the gym or instead of playing basketball or football or whatever and then you hear other coaches chime in and they say well that's because they enjoy it. Like, they enjoy those video games. School is the same way. If you want them to take school seriously, we've got to find ways to help them enjoy it. And then you'll see the buy-in. Uh, so we're working towards that. And some of the ways that we're doing that are, uh, I was really pushing for this high school leadership class. I wasn't sure if it was going to happen this year with our redesign, but I, I get to teach a high school leadership class of about 10 to 15 kids uh, per semester. and we're hoping to give them an opportunity to grow as servant leaders. It'll start out with the first month or two being this unit called 22 Ways to Chase Your Dreams Like Never Before. Uh, I didn't develop it. I just kind of, I learned it through PGC basketball and I adapted it to meet the, the needs of high school students. And it went really well last year. I did it with every class and we're gonna build on that. I made some tweaks and we're going to build on that this year. And then we'll go into book studies throughout the year, uh, books like The Power of uh, Positive Leadership by John Gordon, and then we'll move on to The Power of a Positive Team, or, or Chop Wood, Carry Water by Joshua Medcalf. Um, and moving on to that next one is that we're going to hope to do some of those same book studies with our staff at the same time. That way we have a common language, uh, everyone in the building will be working towards the same goal and then when we go to talk about it it won't just be like the staff knows what we're supposed to be doing but the kids have no idea it can be a unified road that we're all on and the, the biggest one to me in my opinion is that we we are moving to a commitment based culture and away from a behavior based culture a behavior based culture says we are going to react to you based on what you do. And that's how it's always been in education and on the court and the field. 
is if if you mess up or you fail or you don't meet our expectations then you're in trouble and you're not going to enjoy the consequences so a commitment based culture we're saying we're going to try to react to you based on who you are where you've grown up what household you've been in and coaches are always saying man we just went over that for two hours yesterday well, apparently you didn't teach it well enough <laughs> that's the reality of it right or else they would have got it so we're, we're moving in that direction and it starts with making commitment statements like I said it's really exhausting as teachers coaches leaders to every day walk into the room practice and ex try to have all of them meet your expectations we have one expectation that we're expecting 50 to 200 people to meet so as a commitment based culture we're gonna ask them what are you committed to being as a student as a staff what are you committed to doing every single day on our team what is your commitment to our team and then kids staff members we will all read them out loud what we'll talk about them and then it, from there it goes you have to give daily reminders and encouragement hey, you said you were committed to working hard every day in my classroom Do you think you're doing that right now and they'll have to be honest yes or no because if they, if they say no then it's automatically on them it's not you being a jerk anymore they told you from their heart that they're going to be committed and I'm really excited about that and the biggest thing is like we're, we're going to move away from teacher saying man that's just that's just who he is he's never gonna get there that's just how they are and we're gonna start asking this question how can I help you get to where you want to be every day this is what you said you're committed to how can I help you get there so I'm really excited about that uh, and like that quote says down there if we want to change a culture it's not just a one-time thing it's not me standing up in in front of you guys talking about it or to my team we have to fight for it every single day. And if we do that, we're going to be successful no matter what. Thank you. I think Stephen's up next. I wanted to make sure I hit the right button down here. Um, I'm going to share with you kind of our, our goals for um, our school and community relationship. Um, we have kind of a, a unique district makeup, as you can see in the the um, picture there that shows our our district boundaries in green. Um, our district is kind of made up of, of smaller rural communities based around a city center, and so um, one of the one of the challenges that we we decided to tackle was how do we take um, our, our district layout and really help build this sense of community that you have in so many schools? Um, the, the, town, the town that we sit just outside of um, has, has a great community feeling, and, and we really want to try to ha have that also in our school district and also be able to to be there as a community center for our small communities that make up our district um, we we also have in our enrollment about 50 percent of our students are from out of district from the dis district that is in the, the city next to us so we have this unique buildup of these small communities and also families that have come from town uh, to be part of our district uh, so we we were trying to establish um, this this community feeling for all of our students and one of the goals that we have is to try to um, be a resource for families to um, offer offer services um, to families and be a, a learning opportunity for them to um, hopefully in, increase their their education not only for their students and their and their children but also for themselves and incre increase um, learning opportunities for all families in our district and in our community 
Um, we really have great parent involvement in our district, but we really want to see that parent involvement um, be a little more structured so that it is beneficial for all the students in our district. Families are great. There's, there's um, parents who love to come in and say, what can I do for, what can I do for, for you? What can I do for Skyline? And so we hope to be able to um, take those great families and parents that we have and give them um, more of a structure where we can, we can take problems that we see as a district and say, parents, can you help us out with that? And so a, a great model for that is a Booster Club um, where we can take problems or issues and uh, we can take those to a, to a parent booster club and say, we're wanting to do this. Can we have you as parents help us? And really um, be able to move towards a partnership with parents because families are such a great resource for um, education to, to be able to work together with families to ensure that our, all our students' needs are being met. Um, one way that this, is, this has happened so far is um, <clears throat> with our school supply list. Um, every year those come out in August and um, this year the majority of school supplies were um, allocated and offered for students by the school district. So our, our school supply list is very small and very minimal because we as a, a district wanted to um, be able to make sure that every student had the supplies they needed to be successful. Um, <clears throat> another, another concept that we're hoping to, to implement is um, being, being able to have community members come in and um, kind of sh share our space and use our building more as, as a, a meeting place. We've had this, this large project that you'll, um, I think you'll hear more about, um, kind of remodeling our library um, and making it uh, more, of a, more of a gathering place. And hopefully we'll get more community members in um, just, just to be able to come in and, and share our space with us and um, kind of open our doors to our community more. I think Diane's next. I'm going to talk a little bit about our social emotional plans, um, but I'm going to be transparent. I am not the brains behind this plan. We have a master's level psychologist, Sarah Luton, who has done a tremendous amount of work on this. She just wasn't able to be here today. So our journey towards this began with a lot of data collection and also really digging into the data we already had through the Kansas Communities That Cares surveys and then also some uh, surveys through Search Institute and different places. And then, you know, I don't think we'd be authentic if we didn't say that over the course of redesign, um, some of our own stuff in the building bubbled up a little bit. And Sarah really, um, she grabbed a hold of that and recognized that uh, from her mental health background as, as dysregulation. And that that became the focus of what we are going to do in our district. Um, we are going to begin using the self-regulation training system by Brad Chapin. And when you think about social, or I'm sorry, self-regulation, it's really the foundation of, of everything we need to equip kids with. It's, it's that foundational layer for them to become successful later on. Uh, it's building their own toolbox of skills. And when kids or adults are dysregulated, they struggle to demonstrate character. They can't problem solve. You're back here in this part of your brain. You can't problem solve, can't communicate well. And at, at the root of it, you can't learn. Well, all those things are things that employers are saying, and our own community said they want to see out of our graduates, that demonstration of character, problem solving, uh, solid communication skills. So we're going to take a step back 
and we're going to start building that layer. Everything we've chosen to do this year, we've chosen a pre-K to 12 model. We know we have a unique opportunity to speak the same language in our building, and so everything we've done, uh, including this regulation system, we will also, our staff will go through the trauma-informed online academy by Beyond Consequences as we continue to move from being a trauma-sensitive organization to a trauma-informed organization. And we will continue our efforts in bullying prevention through Alan Bean's program. All three of those programs are preschool through 12th grade programs. I'm Herb McPherson. As Becca mentioned, uh, 712 principal. Uh, this is my 22nd year uh, in the district. Um, even though I'm 32, I was like <laughs> Do Doogie Hauser. Um, um, and, and I'm excited. I I'm excited. It has rejuvenated me uh, with education. I was kind of in a little bit of a rut, but I, I, am, I am excited. For this. Uh, I was going to mention one thing before I introduce uh, my characters. Um, it, our philosophy, um, and it was after a basketball game, sometimes we debrief after a ba basketball game with, uh, I debrief with Coach Eddie, and uh, I said something like, well, man, you know, I, I kind of enjoy that, you, that you don't get up and, and yell at kids. You know, he'll, he'll yell, but not at kids. And, and he just looked at me, and this is a paraphrase, and he said, you know, a 16 and 17 year old just messed up in front of 500 people, in front of his best friends, maybe his girlfriend and the other team. He doesn't me, need me yelling at him just to embarrass him more. So, you know, I like that philosophy, and that's kind of how we're working. We're just trying to help kids. We're not trying to beat them down. We're trying to help kids. I'm gonna introduce uh, the promise to all students will experience meaningful learning does not go anywhere without the promise one. Uh, but Morgan Ballard will be the first one. Um, he's 8'12 English. He coaches our girls, high school girls basketball team, uh, and he assists in track. He is the husband of Laura, and he has two little sweet girls, Rylan and Reese. And the other one is Joyce Timonson. She is our kindergarten teacher, and she has three boys, a junior, sophomore, and a seventh grader, and her husband is Bill, and the boys are Eli, Aiden, and Isaac. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you guys for um, for giving us this push. Uh, this is my 14th year of teaching, and honestly, it's probably the most excited I've been going into a school year, uh, knowing the changes. I started with um, uh, the No Child Left Behind, then transitioned into Common Core, and it's not that there weren't good things with those uh, programs, but um, ever since uh, Becca and Herb have started talking to us about this, um, I've been waiting for this school year to start, so, so it's a good thing. But, um, Flex mod scheduling or flexible modular scheduling is something that Herb brought to me um, probably around October of last year. And he said, have you heard of this? Uh, you know, I kind of talked a little bit about it. Um, had never heard of it before. Uh, so went and looked up, uh, you know, some schools that do it. And um, to me, uh, personally, it was kind of like getting to go to college or go to your first job with your mom there, right, for high school level. Um, you know, you get the freedoms and some of those opportunities that you get at a college level, but you also have staff and, and people right there to help you um, when you don't have successes or, or teach you how to have those successes or what happens if you don't. So uh, the first part of that, though, is individualized learning plans. Um, it's going to make the education uh, more about the individual student. It's no longer a group in those kids. You know, you're a freshman, so you're going to take freshman classes. You're going to go to hour one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You know, if you're exceptionally good at math, maybe you leave your friends for an hour and go take a higher level math or whatever, but uh, it kind of gets away from that. Um, and it really focuses on uh, education is not a one-size-fits-all. 
I've got students um, in my English classes that don't need to see me every day for 60 minutes. Um, and they struggle in another class. They really need that extra time in math. Or they could be doing an awesome project out in the uh, ag building or whatever. Um, and it allows kids to do what they do best on a daily basis. So that's a, that's a big thing uh, for me is it's, it's, it gets away from that. Uh, everybody's going to do the same thing. Um, We're going to give them an opportunity to uh, be more involved in their um, education. And it's once again, it's not that we haven't ever met with a, a counselor or um, asked them where they wanted to go or what path they needed to be on. Um, but the kid really gets to sit down and tell you, this is what I, I feel like for me, in the example I just gave, where I want to take Coach Eddie's leadership class. Flexible modular scheduling is going to allow for Coach Eddie to have that class, whereas before, uh, it didn't, you know, he's got his history, his government, his history, and we have to split the kids up. Um, and there's just no time for that type of stuff. Um, and so it allows them to be in that class or it allows them to come to me and say, hey, I've got my comp one paper done and it's Wednesday. You know, what do I do now? It's not due till Friday. Um, and so instead of me giving them extra work, now they can allow themselves to, to be doing other things uh, to improve their own education. Um, flexibility for students and staff. It allows for more collaboration, and, and that's bolded out or in capital letters for a reason um, because it goes around the table. Uh, it's not just collaboration for staff, um, but it's collaboration for students to meet with staff. Uh, we, we were able to build in some uh, office hours um, for teachers, and so kids will be able to come to us during those office hours uh, to drop in and, and get, get extra help, whereas during the seven period traditional day, uh, that, you know, they were moving on to the next class and uh, they didn't necessarily have that opportunity. Um, with uh, the staff, um, with our common plans, um, and, and one of the things I think is cool, and, and Coach Eddie and I were looking at this the other day, he does history and I do um, English, um, is we have a common plan now. Um, and then we also are able to schedule where we have American literature and uh, American history at the same time, where we can culminate that class together. Um, so some days they might be with him, some might be with me. Uh, separately, we might be together, um, and, and you just—it's just impossible to do under an, an, another schedule with as small a district as we have. Um, parents and staff, um, I feel like it'll it'll open up uh, better communication. You know, we get that one plan period, and a lot of times you're trying to get those grades done or or whatever it is, and it eats up your. Uh, plan period, and then we're going to practice after school, and by the time we're done at 6.30 at night, um, you know, and parents aren't around anymore to talk to. Um, you know, so that's going to kind of be on us a little bit more, I think, this year, um, making sure that we're, you know, doing a better job of staying in contact with parents if we need to uh, for successes and failures. Um, students and parents, um, it can lead into more of a uh, – um, student-led conference type of situation, um, you know, where, where the education is falling more on them and their plan is falling more on them, um, where, where they can have those open conversations with their parents and, and kind of be working towards a path where they want to be after high school, whether that be uh, going right to the workforce or, or a two-year college or a four-year college or whatever. Um, and then working with Stephen, trying to figure out ways to get our district and community more involved um, and you know, with a leadership class and some of those other types of classes that we can plug in there, um, you know, it, it gives us opportunities to leave the, the building and, and get out into the community and, and see people and be a part of that. Um, and this is, this is a, another real big one, uh, real life practice. Um, it's going to prepare students for work like college, daily schedules, uh, what have you, um, because it's going to offer them conflicts on a daily basis. Um, it's going to offer them choices. Um, on a daily basis, and it's going to give them a chance to reflect every single day on what went well, what didn't go well, I didn't use my time well today, uh, this is what I can do better tomorrow, um, you know, because they're not going to have a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday that looks the same. Uh, there might be just a tiny tweak in their, in their day, um, like my comp class will meet on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday instead of having them every single day. So it will be a true college class that they're getting college credit for. So they might get an assignment on Monday. And I'll tell them what we're going to be doing on Wednesday. And it's their job to figure out how to get that done before Wednesday. Um, and, and that's a scary thing, I think, to, to some parents. 
Um, I, you know, I visited with one young, one young man's grandpa this summer. Uh, I was helping them with a roof project or whatever, but, um, and he said, oh, I don't know if I like that, you know, because, you know, so-and-so is not the most motivated kid. And I said, yeah, but wouldn't you rather him learn that motivation when we're there to say, you know, this didn't work out so well between Monday and Tuesday, you know, maybe this is something you can change or he can have ownership for that. Uh, like Coach Eddie was talking about uh, teaching those kids ownership um, to fix those things rather than send him out to the workforce or to a college and have him fail without a safety net there. Um, and so I think that's a, that's a big deal. Uh, one of the other um, questions was, uh, how are the students going to take this um, flex mod scheduling? And so what I did with my Comp 1 class, which is juniors, is had them research uh, Comp 1 versus a traditional seven-period day, which is what we were in. Um, and it was up to them. They could write an argument paper, but their job was to research both ways and then uh, decide. They had to write their argument paper over which, which schedule we should be having next year. Um, I did the math, and it wasn't exactly 90%, but it was real close to 90% wanted flex modular scheduling. Uh, they looked at the pros and the cons and decided that um, that would be the best for them. The other 10% went with traditional, and almost 100% of the 10% are kids that want to be told what to do every day in class. You know, you'll give them the assignment, and they, they raise their hand, and they want you to come over and, and tell them, do step one, and then they'll raise their hand, I did step one, what do I do now? Well, you do step two, right? And, and they want you to walk them through that project. So... Uh, but so to, to have that turn out with the kids, I think, is really important. Uh, you know, to have their buy-in first um, was a big deal. So, um, Joyce is next. Yeah, let me uh, let me say we. There are days that we have flexibility. Today is not one of those days. We have we have about ten minutes left. Okay. okay. <clears throat> That's good. I'll hurry. Kindergarten teachers know how to to move. <laughs> um, we started talking about a preschool program in 2016. Our, our own school didn't have a preschool, but our surrounding town did. So most of our students went to the outlying school preschools. Um, what we were finding out when they were coming to us was that a lot of our own district students weren't going to preschool, whether it was due to cost or transportation. What when we started looking in the school board's outcomes for us was to kindergarten readiness, we decided the best way for our district to meet those goals was to have an in-house preschool. So our school board got on board and we started our preschool last fall. Um, we came in, we didn't, I mean, we were flying by the seat of our pants as most preschool teachers do. We started our preschool program and we had some things that we really wanted. We wanted our preschool to be a unique situation because we're a unique school being a K-12 building. So to add a preschool there was important to us. Um, the kindergarten teachers, we wanted a part in that preschool because those students were ultimately coming to us. So we wanted to be a part of their daily life. So we go into the preschool room each session. We have two sessions. Last year we had 26 preschoolers total, but we'd go 30 minutes in the morning and 30 minutes in the afternoon to meet with our preschoolers. What we accomplished with that is we got to know our preschoolers on a personal level. We learned their strengths, we learned their weaknesses, and we were able to meet their needs on an individual level. <clears throat> By doing that, then, we were able to meet some of the higher needs. We brought a preschooler into their kindergarten room because he was reading at a high kindergarten level. So we were able to find that out on an early, an early stage and he was coming into my classroom to read. We also learned that there were some low ones that they didn't even know the letters in their name. So we were able to touch base with them and get them where they needed. So we were able to individualize their plans a little bit better with them being in our building. What we're hoping to accomplish this year when they come into kindergarten is that they're familiar with us, and so we're not gonna have that transition time. Um, the first two weeks of kindergarten are stressful for them because they're coming in, they're learning a new building, they're learning new teachers, they're learning new routines. Um, I think all but four of our 
kindergartners that are coming in this year attended our preschool. So they're walking in and they have already got a good base. We know where they're at. I know that my one student is going to be reading already and I know my other student, I'm gonna to have to spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with them. So it's gonna give us a better perspective of where they're coming in. I'm gonna skip over. Um, the ASQ has been a learning experience for us. Um, we weren't sure how to implement that, but what we ended up doing is we put it on our school website. Um, we sent out an alert to all of our preschool parents or kindergarten parents letting them know it was online. They could get online, sign in, and fill out the questionnaire. At this time, so far we've only had two families fill out that questionnaire for us. So we know that didn't quite meet the needs that we wanted it to do. So in two weeks, we have a kindergarten parent orientation. And at that point in time, then we will be able to sit down with parents and really kind of walk them through how to get to that screening process. And hopefully we'll get more of the parents to fill that out. We'll also make you know, technology available for them so that they can do it online there at school. They can do paper pencil version also, and we would enter the results. Um, as a kindergarten teacher, I'm excited to see those results because again, I think it's gonna help us better meet the needs of our students in our district at that point in time. I think that, did I miss anything? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll turn it over. An important part of our journey has been discovering that we needed to provide enrichment opportunities for all of our students if we want to have a hope of closing the gap, leveling the playing field for all of our kids. So I couldn't be any more thrilled to tell you that this year, um, all preschool through sixth graders in our building will um, have art 50 minutes a day. We've hired an art teacher. They will also have STEM 50 minutes a day. Our high schoolers will have access to our art teacher too to work on individual projects to um, either because they're passionate about it or to complete a fine arts credit. We continue to partner with our local community college and um, we've gotten really creative on internships and the job opportunities through work release and at the core of all of that is flexibility. We've also, um, our elementary intervention time has been effective but there were some tweaks that we needed to make to those. Uh, and so we're taking a more focused tier three approach for K to two. And then kids need some intervention during PBL. PBL brings out uh, real skills that kids need some help with. At the high school level, we've revamped the way we do eligibility and um, it's, it's been tough, but it's been successful. And um, through this FlexMod schedule, we've been able to provide time for our students to meet with teachers that have those needs. I definitely want to get up here, Sherry Gates, who uh, is our fifth, sixth grade ELA social studies teacher. She is a trailblazer for PBL. She started that many years ago with a team and she'll share a little more about her journey. I just wanna say the same thing about Morgan. This will be my 18th year teaching. I have never been more excited to start a school year. So um, I was sitting in a professional learning one year and it was 2010 and our superintendent at the time showed us a video about the Walton Rural Life Center and he kind of challenged us would anybody be interested in doing some project-based learning and I'm sitting there going yeah I think that sounds pretty cool sounds fun I had two boys in school I knew the way that we were teaching them the same way that I was taught, the same way their grandparents were taught, was really not effective and we needed to start making some changes. So um, in 2011, 2012, we started doing PBL. I will tell you it was not pretty. <laughs> we had some failures. We had a lot of people, at that time I'd been teaching 10 years, I had people questioning me, my professionalism, they kind of thought we were doing fluffy stuff and didn't really have much content included in our PBL. Our, our administration was very supportive, not so much some of our staff members um, and parents. It was hard to get the parents to buy in. And I also felt like we were still really too focused on what our state assessment scores were and not the whole child and meeting the needs of all children and that those 21st century skills, Buck Institute calls it um, success skills. We were not meeting the needs of those. Um, so this will be my eighth year of doing PBL. Um, also this 
summer in August, we went ahead and trained 85% of our staff in the Buck Institute Gold Standard um, PBL 101. They have a framework. It's called the seven, seven Essential Project Design Elements. So we knew we need a common language between our, P, our preschool through 12th grade um, teachers. We um, knew that we needed a framework that was proven research-based to actually work for our students to have those real-world learning experiences. And our goal this year is for every class to have implemented at least one project per semester. I will tell you that our fifth, sixth grade spend four days a week for an hour doing PBL. Our third through fourth grade will spend five days a week, 30 minutes a day doing PBL. If we have, and then um, that every student's going to uh, gain those success skills, which you know the, our community told us those were important. Critical thinkers, problem solvers, being able to collaborate, and having effective self-management skills. We're going to blow on through that. <laughs> yeah, and that's the, big, the, the part, two big so. things here are thrive and fully prepared. And when they're, we say fully prepared, that means to pursue their passions. We're not going to fully prepare them. We just want them to get ready, get them on their way. Graduation is not an end. It's just the beginning. We, on behalf of Skyline Schools, we want to thank the State Board of Education, Dr. Watson, for your leadership in the Kansans Can vision and the challenge to redesign. Jay and Tammy for their support and expertise. We're thrilled to get to work with them the rest of this next year as, as we know that we have not perfected this. We know we have a lot to learn still on redesign and the research would say that we're going to be on this journey of redesign for a long time, probably forever. But today, August 15th, I know we're a better school district than we were because we submitted that application back in July of 2017. And when it's gotten hard and challenging this year, we've gone back over and over again to our mission statement that we want to live it out in such a way that every person that's associated with our community believes us when we say every T-bird every day. Thank you. I have time for one, wait, one quick question, Ken. Yes, Sally, if you're ready to make the motion. Because of our time constraints. Thank you, Ken. Um, I'll go ahead and say um, probably that, that Ken would agree with me that you, awesome presentation. You also have come forth with a redesign plan of many things that we haven't heard before. And so you are unique to meeting the needs of your community. And that's what we as a board want for redesign in the state of Kansas is that you meet the needs of the students in your community and the families in your community. And uh, we appreciate the thought and the effort that you've all put into it. Even though we had to cut your time short, uh, I want you to know that we really heard some awesome things. And um, we may be contacting you as individuals to, to hear more about what you have to say. Mr. Chairman, I move to accept the redesign plans of Skyline Pratt USD 438 for the Skyline Elementary and the Skyline High School to be implemented during the 2018-29 school year. Isn't that this year? As a participant in the Gemini One project, and I certainly hope that you've already gotten off to a wonderful start <laughs> at Skyline. Motion made by Sally Cobble, seconded by Ken Willard. Any further discussion? We don't have time for that. Raise your hand if you're <laughs> <laughs> Unanimous. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. We have presentations to make. Usually we present an elementary and a secondary, but this, since you're together, do you want to do them together? Yes. Yes. Okay. I can hold two of those things up. Can, can be in the picture since he was their representative longer than I was? Anybody that wants to okay. be in the picture can be in the picture. Okay, thank you. I'm excited for you. Thank 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 you. Thank
Continue, please. We're looking right. forward well, to the next you. presentation. All right. Well, thank you. Next up, we're proud to present Ashland USD 220. Welcome to the State Board of Education. We're excited to hear from you today. My name is Jamie Wedick. I'm the superintendent and uh, principal in Ashland USD 220. And we are excited to be here today. And we want to thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, I'll do some introductions real quick. Uh, to my right is uh, Mr. Jason Endicott. He's the elementary principal. And he is also the chair of our KESA committee. And then on my left, we have Alexa Daly. Alexa is a math teacher and curriculum coordinator for us. And we have Haley Walker, who is student support. Um, career exploration class leader, uh, ITV leader. So uh, as many rural and small districts, we serve in multiple roles. Um, and uh, I guess without further ado, I'll go ahead and begin. Um, we are excited. And do we have uh, the ability to? Oh, oh, it's right here. Oh, it's right here. Yeah. All right. So we have the uh, district leadership team. Again, it is made up of multiple individuals throughout the district. Everybody that's represented on there, uh, minus Jason and myself, uh, serves as a classroom teacher as well. And I will let Mr. Endicott talk about our st vision statement. Well, our vision statement, um, we, we spent a lot of time kind of crafting a vision statement. We wanted something that, that um, kind of tipped its hat to our, to our community and how proud we are of our school and how how we've always worked together very closely with our community but we also wanted to say very specifically that we were going to go in a, a, a different direction than what we have and I'll just read it for you and then I'll try to explain it as as I go here but it says USD 220 believes in the rigorous and innovative traditions of our past we seek to create a school system that develops lasting partnerships between the students their families community members and the faculty USD 220 will also develop opportunities for all students to explore multiple careers and training that recognize and build on each student's strengths. And I'll just preface that statement just a little bit more and say, um, I've been in Ashland now, this is my 26th year to be in the district. I don't know any other district other than Ashland USD 220. I'm very proud of that. Um, and I can tell you that when I came there in 1993, um, Ashland has, and we still do, but at that time we had a very, very strong reputation as a, as a college preparatory school. Uh, our kids, we, we felt like that that was the most important thing that we could do. We felt like that the kids who came out of our, our building were, were ready to set and ready set to go uh, to, to do very, very well in any four-year school that they chose to do. And that was our mission. And we did extremely well on, on, the, student, uh, on the state assessment test. Um, and, and we stacked our academics up against anything else uh, in the district. And we were, we were very proud of that. Um, with the new accreditation system, what is so exciting is that um, now we get to really do some educating. It's not just the upper echelons of kids um, that, that, we, that we are worried about, that we're concerned about. We're looking at everybody in the building, everybody in the district. What is it that they want to do? What is it that they're good at? What strengths do they have? And, and how can we help foster that and, and get them out there so they can do well, whether it's a four-year school, two-year school, whether it's military, whether it's just, just going straight into the workforce. But we want everybody who walks out of that school, and when we say everybody, we really mean everybody. We want everybody who walks out of that school as a senior to be prepared and ready to go. And so someone who's been there for a while and who and was very one-sided, and I was an English teacher for many years there at the, at the school, um, our job was to get them ready for college. And I think back and go, we probably probably didn't serve some kids as well as we could have. And so I'm very, very proud of our new accreditation system and the things that we're doing at school here to, to really look at all the kids. And so our vision statement, I hope, uh, mirrors, that, mirrors that pride that we have in our district and, and that, that hope that we have for all of our kids. Okay. Well, in the spring of 2017, we chose uh, two evidence-based practices, or what they're commonly known as the R's, uh, to focus on. And after we went through and we did our survey, we, we looked at all of the ones that were there and available and everything, and we chose very specifically, we chose relationships and rigor. Okay? Um, and then as we go through a little bit further, we said, what are we really good at? 
and what could we improve on? And we decided that we would rely on our strength and our, we've always had a great relationship with our community. They've always supported us um, in a town of 900 people. You know, you have to have a good working relationship with your community. But we also said one thing that we can really do better with that and improve on is, is more family engagement. And so we decided uh, that that was something that we wanted to, to hone and sharpen our skills with and get more involved with, with our families, not just the community at large there. And then, of course, under rigor, we chose to focus on career and technical education. We had an incubus. We had a, a, a little bit of career and tech ed going, and we said, let's really see what we can do because we think that they complement each other very well with the family engagement piece and also the career and tech. If you're going to work with your community to really educate your kids, K through 12, then you're going to want to reach out to your community in a lot of different ways. We have a, we have a great town. We have a great community and they have really embraced a lot of our new initiatives about working with our kids, especially when it comes to the career and tech education. Uh, we have a lot of volunteers who are, are going to be coming into the school and giving their expertise. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but, but the career and tech ed at the high school level especially is, is really exciting to see those kids getting involved in, in things that before you know, they may not have been able to experience. And so just the impetus of that has been a lot of fun so far, and we, we look for that to grow considerably. All right, so now what? Okay. Well, simply put, uh, we'll continue to build on the initi initiatives that we started in, in 17 and 18. So we've created, uh, we work very closely with Southwest Plains and certainly with Jay and Tammy here, uh, and we've created some building plans, some very specific things that we want to do uh, for both the grade school and the high school. Uh, and in a, in a small town, you know, we're, we're lucky enough we have a grade school and we have a high school. Uh, and quite frankly, there used to be, we used to kind of go our own thing, you know, back in the old, uh, um, the accreditation cycle. Um, it was, it, there was a difference there. And we've worked very hard to create a system approach. And so even though the building plans look a little bit differently, they're designed to complement each other. Uh, and the high school is going to shine at some things, and the, and the grade school is going to shine at some things. But together, we're going we're gonna to be, we have the same goals. We just have a little bit way, different way of getting there. So our elementary building plan is we want to continue to work with our, eight, our, our El Ashland Elementary, our PTO. And before, really last year, we didn't have very much of a PTO. Uh, it was a very loose organization, but, but I, I, I've enjoyed working with those folks. It's amazing what we can get done when we sit down and we work together and do some, do some neat things for the kids. Um, we have our, our first meeting of the year uh, next Tuesday evening, and so we've been getting excited for that and some of the projects that we're going to be doing. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with Seesaw, but Seesaw is, a, is an app out there that is a, it's, we're using it at both buildings as our primary school to home communication tool. And so we want parents to know what's going on in their classroom, in their kids' classroom. We want them to know immediately. So we use Seesaw district-wide, and it has really been a fantastic addition to, to how we communicate with our families. Um, it, it's a simple, easy app. Kids can get on there. They can make a post. Nothing goes out until the parent or to the, till the teacher um, okays it. So teacher has control over what goes out on his or her uh, communication. But we, we're encouraging teachers to use it um, to brag about what it is that their kids are doing in the classroom. So we want our parents to know, and, and we're using that, and it's an immediate app. Parents need, know exactly what's happening when those teachers make that post because they get a ding on their phone, and they can look it up right then and see what's happening. Um, we want to change our traditional parent-teacher conference to a modified student-led uh, conference at the grade school. We'll have a little bit more information about that and what that exactly is going to look like. Um, we're going to use the CC Spark um, part of career cruising to introduce kids to different kinds of, of, of careers. We're going to uh, show them kind of what it takes. And then we've also created just some, uh, some in-house things that we can do. It's called Ashland Works, and we'll talk more about that later. And those, again, support our rigor rubric. We are we're sur surveying kids on social emotional character development things. We've we've of course had a, a character development thing called DTRT or do the right thing for a while, and that's a, it's a lot of fun. We 
whenever the kids do something right, the kid, the parents give them, a, or the teachers give them a little coupon, they bring it down to the office, and I give them a dum-dum sucker, and it's amazing the power of dum-dums have over <laughs> things like that. So that's, that's a lot of fun to do, and then we have a little recognition that we do for each, uh, each class then at the end of each nine weeks. Um, we use ROSI Learning, and I don't know if you're familiar with that, it's a pretty new um, uh, um, Thing on the internet. Um, anyway, it's, it, it has a lot of STEM lessons that also have a career slant. So when we present a ROSI, um, uh, a lesson to our kids, not only are they, are they seeing a little bit about what it is, so if you, when they do a, a, um, a STEM project based on, let's say, uh, engineering, but then they get, a, they get a little learn about a little bit what an engineer does or a, or a um, Archaeologist, and so those are a couple that we've done there. Um, and then we want to go through, we have a lot more emphasis on our parent engagement committee, so we're wanting to get more people in here to our school, to our elementary school, and it can be in the form of doing some STEM projects with kids and parents. Uh, it can be in the form of just, you know, some game night kind of things where we're actually getting the kids out there and the parents and interacting with the teachers and the and, and everybody together. So we're looking forward to those things. That essentially is our elementary building plan. And then our high school building plan is um, similar, but it, it, it focuses on a little bit different things there. We want to expand our involvement of our booster club and, and incorporate more parent engagement activities instead of just being the sports parents. You know, we want to get those folks involved and in, 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 in make it more inclusive rather than just, just a few parents whose kids play sports. Um, we want to use Seesaw as a high school as well as at the grade school, and that's going to be our principal home to school communication at both buildings. Uh, and that's going to play into a lot more when our student-led conferences are there. So there is a little bit of method to our madness there. Um, something that I'm very proud of and I'm, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about later is our AHS families. Uh, family group, and that's a social emotional um, group that's, I'll let Haley kind of talk about that a little bit more, but we're real excited about that. Um, and that's going to be neat how we're going to put that together and kids are going to be able to come together as kids with a teacher in the room, but still being able to talk about things um, that are important to them. And there's also a small curriculum that goes along with that too. Of course, career cruising, most schools across the state are using that. Um, to complement our rigor, uh, and, and that's how we're going to create our, our individual plans of study. And another thing that's very unique to us here is um, the career education class, and again, you're going to learn a little bit more about that later, but it's not just a mentorship or a work-study program. It incorporates a lot of different activities and a lot of different skill sets, and so even in little Ashland, Kansas, we're going to be able to put kids into career-type situations where they can where they can get some good experience uh, about what it is maybe that they're interested in doing. And so we're, we're looking forward to that, and that's going to start. Uh, well, it started right now, so we've got kids involved with that. Of course, one of the big things that the high school is going to be involved with is expanding our CTE pathways, and we're going to have seven, or, excuse me, 11 CTE pathways at, in Ashland, Kansas, and that, that's a, a pretty big number, and we're very proud of that. So we'll talk, we'll talk about that later. And then maybe one of the biggest changes up there, and uh, this is to me is a little bit funny, we're going to create an ag program, and we're going to have an FFA chapter. And I will just tell you just real quickly, uh, we've never had an ag program, but Clark County in southwest Kansas is probably one of the most rural ag places that you can imagine. And for all the years that I've been there, we've never had an ag program. And so we're super excited about this. And just on a real personal note, i got to tell you, um, my son, who's a freshman this year, he's going to be the beneficiary of a lot of these things here. Um, I am not an ag person. I've lived in Ashland and in small towns my whole life, but I, I know that cows taste good, and that's about all I know about them. Um, but he is so excited. He's, uh, he wants to be in the ag sector somehow. He's worked for several farmers around, uh, around town, and this year he worked at a uh, feed yard. Loved every minute of it. He got to drive everything imaginable out there and feed cows and work cows and things like that. And he just comes home every day, and he's excited. Dad, we got to do this. And, I, and so I'm excited that we're going to be offering those kinds of activities and same thing that, that, that benefits him because if it was up to me, if it were up to me, I wouldn't know how to, to – to make those opportunities work for him. So I'm excited that we're doing this ag program and that we're having all these, these career pathways and everything. So I can see very quickly that it's going to be beneficial to at least one young man in Ashland, Kansas.
All right. So, so just on that note, I really am talking Andrew, who is Jason's son, into getting a cow and chickens at his house. Um, <laughs> But I, I want you to walk away from today's presentation, not just what we do with, with our keys and our accreditation, but I want you to understand we take a lot of pride in what we're implementing in Ashland, Kansas. Small rural and agriculture communities and schools sometimes aren't able to offer some of those other items or those extracurricular academic or, or activities. But um, we are doing a lot of good things in Ashland, and, and I hope by the end of this presentation, you'll say, hey, we need to go out there and see Ashland. So if you have questions, feel free to interject at any time. Uh, so we are in year two of our five-year accreditation cycle, um, and so we'll move through. Um, we are documenting everything with Kansas Star. I think, Jason, you want to talk about this as well, Kansas Star? Yeah, sure. Um, well, um, I, I don't know how familiar you are with Kansas Star. Um, it is the vehicle that the state has provided for schools if they wish to track their progress, to measure their progress. Uh, we found that it is a, a fantastic source uh, because part of the question was, is when we started this, um, we, we've, we've chosen our two R's here. We've chosen uh, relationships and rigor. Now what do we do exactly? So Kansas Star has kind of provided some of those answers, and, and I don't know how familiar you are with it, so I, I don't want to uh, spend a lot of time on that. But what Kansas Star allows us to do, it, it gives us a tremendous amount of information, research-based, for lack of a better term, interventions or initiatives that we can use, and it gives us information that says this is what they should look like. So it's, it's research-based things that we can take, we can modify to make them work for USD 220 and, and, and Ashland. So we're using Kansas Star quite a bit. Um, we're getting a lot of good information from it. Um, I, so under relationships, the first uh, Kansas Star indicator is all teachers will meet with family members and formally at least two times a year to engage in two-way communication regarding students' cognitive, social, emotional, and physical development outside the classroom. So what this is basically doing is taking the place of the traditional one-night parent-teacher conference um, where, the, where the, you know, if you're a high school teacher, you're trying to meet with um, 70 kids or 70 sets of parents in one evening. It's not very effective. You get to talk about grades and really that's about it. Um, so it, expanding that, expanding our contact and expanding our, our relationship with parents, we chose to do a student-led conference, okay? and it it's going to look a little bit differently at each building, um, simply because it's just we're dealing with a little bit different uh, age of kids. So at the high school, um, it's going to look a great deal differently. Uh, the following approach: the conferences will be student-led. No longer will they be limited to the traditional one-day evening time frame. A new timeline for meeting with parents will begin weeks six to nine of the second and fourth nine weeks. So it's, we're going to expand our parent-teacher conference time to about a three-week period there. So in the second nine weeks, we'll start talking to parents in, a, in a, the format type um, and take about three weeks to do. Okay? Um, the seminar teacher will conduct conferences with their students. They will also insist in maintaining the student's IPS or portfolio, which will contain the following information. So this is a little bit here is about what, what the kids are going to talk about, what this new thing will look like here. So they'll have a conference script. Uh, we'll have a teacher report from each classroom teacher will submit a, a report to the uh, seminar teacher. And then that teacher will then have all that information available for parents. Of course, the IPS, we're excited about that and how that's going to look and what information that we can get off of there. Uh, examples of class projects, what the kids are working on in the classroom. Uh, a grade report, notice a grade report is just that, it's grades. I mean, parent-teacher uh, parent conferences need to be more than just talking about grades. We want to talk about what the kids are interested in, what they're doing in class, where they want to go, what they, what they expect from us. Okay? And so if you need to meet with an individual teacher, you can set that up any time. So going back to Seesaw, if we're using Seesaw to communicate with parents on a very regular basis uh, about what their kids are doing, what special things are happening, what assignments are coming up, then it eliminates a lot of the need to have that direct conversation with a, with a parent at a parent-teacher conference. So we feel very strongly that, that we can use our seminar teachers 
to work with a smaller group of kids and really give parents a lot more information rather than just grades because there's as you all know there's a lot more important things that we're doing right now rather than just making the grades so a lot more to talk about okay um, and then I'm and the elementary school is going to look a little bit different um, we'll still have um, a few nights but usually we take about a week at the grade school and ask parents to come in I, um, the students are going to create they're going to be a part of it usually we we kind of say well in the past I, parents we don't really need to bring their kids so we can just visit with the parents but we want kids to be there so what they're going to do now is they're going to create basically a small PowerPoint. Each, each student will create a small PowerPoint or a Google slide. And some of the things that they'll include, um, uh, what they're currently working on in class, some special projects, what kids feel that they can do well, what they need to work on. Um, and the student will then kind of present that. The teacher and the student and the parents will be in the same room. They'll present it. It shouldn't last very long. And then we'll set up a station where the kids can go and over here and sit. And then the teacher can sit and really visit with the parents about grades, about social emotional. So we want just a whole lot more involvement in all of that. And then, of course, any kind of social emotional character development things that we're doing in class. And again, it goes back to our use of Seesaw. And our idea is, is that if we're communicating with parents on a very regular basis, we're, we're bragging about what it is that the, our, their kids are doing. The, kids sh the parents should know what the kids are doing in the classroom. And so we want to expand the parent-teacher conference into something more than certainly just talking about grades. Okay. I hope you can tell by Jason's uh, enthusiasm. He is, you know, when someone spends 26 years in the community, he is not just bought into the KISA process, but this is what he has enjoyed the most. If you ask him today, what he's enjoyed most is, is the vision that Dr. Watson has brought to the schools to be able to make these changes. So I know that you don't want to hear us speak the entire time. We want to hear from the teachers as well. Um, but the Families Initiative, I'm really excited about that, is a focus on social emotional character development. And I'll let Haley come up here and we'll kind of tag team or answer the questions together. So you want to talk about our families? Sure. Um, this is obviously very important to me as a student support uh, person in the district. So with um, 7 through 12, we're going to utilize what we've, um, we've had peer helpers in the past. We're going to kind of rename that to Blue Jay Leaders. And those students will go through uh, training about leading their peer groups. And we're going to have just fall, uh, small groups of five students. Um, those students will lead those um, small family groups. And they will use the harbor. Um, that's from Jostin's Renaissance. They'll be um, small video clips for them to watch, and then kind of critical thinking questions that our Blue Jay leaders will kind of lead the family discussion. And we're going to meet um, every two, two weeks in our families, and those families will then also go um, to their uh, IPS time, seminar time is what we call it, and be with that same teacher that they had in the family group too. So we hope not only to build the relationship among peers and students, but also just making sure that each adult in the building is connected with each of our students. And this just kind of defines it a little more for you. We really want to give our students, and so this is a 712 group. That's a mixed group, small groups with these kids leading these conversations, building connections with each other. Sometimes kids might not be able to go to an adult, but we want them to go to another student. So again, this is a small group. It's a mix between our kids, 7 through 12. The teachers are more of a facilitator, but they're in the background. You can ask the teacher, how many kids do you know in a school, no matter what school district it is, and then ask them how many teachers or how many kids will go up to you and say they have a connection. So we were truly, truly trying to build connections among our kids and those important topic, topics in character education and develop those leadership skills as well. And so we've got the schedule down. If it's not scheduled, it doesn't happen. So we'll be meeting twice a month within these groups. Uh, relationships, again, uh, you've heard Seesaw. I think being in a small district, it is important to have that systemic uh, piece of communicating with your parents. And so Seesaw will be utilized pre-K through 12th grade. Um, 
And as you see, we want it to be absent of the educational jargon. We want it just to be, what are we doing? What are these kids doing? What are the positive things uh, each and every day? How can we build those deposits with the families? You want to talk about your curriculum, guys? Sure. All right. Um, one of the things we have done to kind of create for the parents that jargon-free guide um, is we created a comprehensive curriculum guide. It goes over three things. It talks about what curriculum students are learning at each grade. So we kind of took the standards and put them in family-friendly terms. And then the second is what interventions are being utilized at each grade level or each grade cluster at least. And then the third is what assessments are our students taking. So that's available for our parents anytime they want it. Um, we have it up on the district page, I believe. It got put up. We just finished it over the summer. So we have that up for our parents and then the staff as well. So that if there is maybe an intervention that I'm not using at the high school that I could be, that maybe they are using in sixth or seventh grade, I can go talk to one of those teachers and say, what is this? How does it work? Is it something I could be using as well? Career cruising. Um, we are also using, as they said previously, career cruising to guide our IPS. Um, students 6th through 12th grade are using the actual career cruising side of that, and then our elementary, actually pre K to 5th, are using the CC Spark, which is, as Jason mentioned, kind of game based, um, just gaining information about what careers are out there and some of those things they do. I have a first grader and she played it last year and kind of come home and saying, you know, she played this game and I knew in my head what it was because I helped set it up. But she didn't really realize that she was learning with that. And I think for those younger kids especially, that's huge. Um, but for our high school and our junior high kids, we're able to, in our seminar time, go over their IPS with them. They do a career matchmaker every year based on their interests. Um, every couple years they do an abilities profiler that looks at where their math and English skills are. And we can use that to say, does that match with what you're wanting to do? Because if not, it's either need to work on those skills or we need to look at different career options. Um, and then at the end of each year, the advisor will sit down with every kid, not just at the end of the year, but throughout the year and again at the end of the year and go through those with each student to see what progress are you making towards graduation, towards college credits, applications for whatever field they're looking to go into, either college or the workforce. Corrections. So part of the rigor, um, we, we've always had work study for our juniors and seniors, and that's the opportunity for them to go out into the community and work in different careers, but we were not quite intentional enough with that. And so with the emphasis of rigor, that has kind of allowed us to kind of really look at that and kind of zone in our focus. So Alexa and Jason and I had the opportunity to come up here to Seaman High School, and they utilize um, a curriculum called Bring Your A-Game to Work, and they have a well-versed um, program going, and so she showed us a lot of her stuff, what works for them, what doesn't work for them, and we've just kind of taken that and run with it. Um, so they have three weeks in the classroom at the beginning of the semester, and then they go out into the field. Um, the hope is to, we're using career, the career cruising to match that, get them some experience in Ashland which some people might think is not possible, but we are making that work. And um, like I have a kid right now that really wants sports management and marketing, and I've really struggled, like where am I gonna get a marketing? But that has um, come 360 and is going to be probably one of my favorite um, experiences. So I'm really looking forward to where he goes with that. He's a junior, so it'll be good. Um, they'll go out into the field and during the week, and they'll be back in the classroom one day a week um, 
doing some journaling, reflecting what's working, what's not working, all with that curriculum that we've purchased to go with that. You've done a lot of work with that. Um, another thing on that is at the end of the semester, they will come back and present their journal and their feelings on that career and is it something they're still interested in doing with their lives and they will present that to members of the community who want to attend their career mentor who they shadowed and worked with for the semester as well as staff members so that gives them some good presentation time and experience as well So again, we have done some of the traditional things um, that a lot of schools do. Um, Life 101 is just a time that we bring community members in to um, talk with seniors about things that they're going to experience next year, um, leasing an apartment, um, insurance. Our sheriff comes in and talks about legal issues. We have the county attorney come in and talk about maybe some legal expenses or um, what they need to know. Um, there's various uh, topics with that. We also will um, have always and will continue to go to like our community college for technical day and um, always encourage college visits. We have, of course, um, people from colleges come in, admission representatives come in and talk to juniors and seniors. We have financial aid workshops, um, all the traditional things I think that most schools do for juniors and seniors. So um, you've heard a little bit about our pathways. Um, yes, we have 11 pathway classes for students. Um, that is a lot to offer in a small town of 900, but um, we are very proud of those pathways. So that's kind of a quick glimpse at them. We have an incredible technology teacher that offers a lot of great things um, in that along with certifications, which you'll see a list of those here in a little bit, but we are really proud of the ag program that we're going to bring and the pathways that come with that. So right here is just the certifications that um, we can offer our students in the technology department. Um, and those have also been recognized as some college credit when students go off to um, some two-year colleges. So that has been an incredible asset for our students. Also, for kids who are not necessarily going to a two or four year college, these will look really good on a resume too when they're first getting out of school. You know, if they're already coming out of high school, a certified Microsoft Office specialist, that could help them get a leg up on someone else who doesn't have any of those certifications. Well, um, the, the high school is really going to shine, I think, with the rigor, uh, especially with the CTE pathways and all of that. But I look at uh, the elementary's role as, as being kind of a supporting role on that. And so we certainly want to use the CC Spark software um, to support what the kids are going to learn once they get up there and be um, and are involved in career cruising and developing their IPS. Uh, we use ROSI learning again, that's uh, just brief pre-made STEM lessons. And I don't know how familiar, familiar you are with STEM, but science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, there's, there's STEM and then there's PBL. And our, our view is that STEM should be something that they can incorporate and do in about an hour. Uh, whereas as project-based learning is a lot longer, a lot bigger projects and everything. So we've really chosen to invest with uh, ROSI Learning. And it's, again, pre-made STEM projects that have a career slant to them. So kids can learn about what it's like to be a petroleum engineer or any kind of an engineer. Um, they can be, I think I mentioned, an, an archaeologist earlier. So not only do they get to actually do a STEM project based around some of those, those careers, but they get to see a little bit about what those careers actually entail, the, the amount of schooling that one has to go through, uh, what the working conditions are going to be like. And so it, it's a precursor to kids choosing maybe a career. 
Okay. Um, one of the things that I'm really proud of is we've created something called Ashland Works, and this was in direct response to our our, um, our our rigor initiative. But we wanted to take our fifth and sixth graders, especially, and we wanted to take them out into our community and show them how Ashland works. And so we take our fifth, fifth and sixth graders out as a group, uh, and then we tour different organizations, different businesses, um, and and we ask the folks who who conduct the tours. Tell us what it is that you do for a living. Uh, we want kids to see how and why mom and dad have to get up and go to work every day and what they do when they're there. We also ask our folks who are conducting the tours to talk about the big things that we teach in school all day long, reading and math. How do you use reading? How do you use math? What skills do you have to have to make this job work? Some of the, some of the best little field trips that we've done, we've gone to uh, a, a large cattle ranch there, uh, and that, that one was terrific. Um, and, we, and some of our graduates work there, their family owns it, and they were gracious enough to really take the kids and show them some of the neat, neat things that really happen on, on, a, on a big operation like that. One of the neatest things was we got to go to the, we have a, a city department that we have the capability of producing our own electricity there for Ashland. And so we had one of the dads, his, his daughter was a sixth grader at that time, uh, he showed us all around how the city department works, you know, how the streets are fixed. We got to go and see, you know, how the water is purified and how the, how the system works. One of the best parts of that, we got to go to the sewer pond, so we got to see how that all worked. <laughs> and that was actually, the kids thought that was one of the neatest things. Um, we've toured some of the larger businesses there that we have. Uh, we have a, a large feed and seed uh, a business that you buy uh, your feed there for your cattle. They make their own, uh, 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 they clean seed, they make their own feed. They also have a tire shop. So in Ashland, if you have a, a battery that goes bad or a flat tire, that's where you go. And we wanted kids to, we want kids to see how Ashland works. And certainly we think that complements the rigor. We also want to work in conjunction with our some of our local groups. Ashland 2020 is a group that are that's kind of an offshoot of our Chamber of Commerce. And when we when we formulated this, um, we kind of asked the Chamber of Commerce if, if they would at some of their meetings talk about this and help introduce that. And I went to some of those meetings and talked about it. Um, but we also want to show that Ashland is a good viable community. It's a good safe community. And yes, we want you to we want you to be able to go off to that college of your choice or that career choice, but also think about, you know, Ashland's a good town. And maybe think about coming back here. And so we think Ashland Works fits in well with some of our community outreach that we're doing. Um, we want to show kids that, that you, can, you can make a living in Ashland and you can raise a family. I know all of us have made that commitment and we've been there and, and we're raising our families and, and our kids there and everything. So we want to share that too. And our, go and our, um, our goal is just to work more closely with Ashland and show the kids that there is a lot going on in that little town and that they can be a part of it too if they so choose. And then finally, I'm going to let Mr. Wittig just, talk just about our... our we our, we, we well, don't have any time flexibility today. We have about 10 minutes left and we have a question that... Okay, that needs to we're almost that. finished. I think our last slide. <laughs> It's already been mentioned. Um, we are starting our very first ag education program in Ashland this year. Uh, and, and along with that is the FFA program. Uh, you, you would have wondered why we didn't have FFA or ag for all these years. Um, but I couldn't be prouder of a program that we're implementing and initiating, and it's got the community and county support. So uh, again, I won't you know, belabor that point, but we are excited to have ag education out there in Ashland. So, and this is our last slide. I will say we went through this. We actually have names. I'm not sure we followed it very well. <laughs> but um, without Jason, who is the chair, I hope you can see his expertise. And this is his strength. This is his, what he takes a lot of pride in. Uh, and then we have uh, Alexa and Haley. And we try to make this open our buildings to make it more friendly for our parents, the communication, and add those opportunities for our kids. So. Thank you. Ann. Thank you. It's all very exciting. And I. Just wonder, um, looks like you have a four-day week. Do you think that helps, or, I mean, does that impact uh, how you're able to do all this? I would say the four-day school week uh, in Ashland is a benefit for us out there for multiple reasons. But when you look at, say, the, the CTE pathways, mm -hmm. it certainly provides opportunities for the kids to get out more. On, like, Friday they can? Correct. Okay, cool. Thank you. How long have you had that? I believe we started that in 2004. Okay, so it's been a while. It's been a while. Are there any other questions? 
Sally, are you ready to make a motion? My pleasure. Thank you, Chairman. Very much, for coming today and sharing your redesign. We. Um, we're excited to sit around this table and listen to you. We've uh, spent many years discussing and hashing and um, knowing that we want to get off of the um, test scores being the only thing we measure. And so um, it's nice to be able to see it out in the communities and working. So thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I move to accept the redesigned plans of Ashland USD 220 for the Ashland Elementary and the Ashland Junior Senior High to be implemented during the 2018-19 school year as a participant in Gemini One project. Thank you. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Tina seconds the motion. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed? Congratulations, your Pratt plan has been approved. We now have certificates and banners to present to you, and we can do it two ways. Uh, we it's we have a elementary banner, and we have a and we have a secondary banner. We can do them separately, or we can do them together. We typically do them separately. I would say we just do them together. Okay. We, we, we want to think in terms of the system. It's your call. So we'll do we'll do it together then. And uh, at noon at the uh, at Cedar Crest.